All right, we're on. We're on, we're on. Welcome to everybody online. Uh, you're joining in. We, we, we're already, we're our, we've been going. So we've had a time here in the Spirit of God. And so we're glad to bring you into where we are in the presence of God. And um, tonight, as everybody here knows, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to talk to them real quick, and then I'm going to come back and they can listen in. We're talking, and the message of tonight is this. His name is Jealous, and it's out of Exodus chapter 34. So thanks for joining us. Now, we are going to have a powerful night. His name is Jealous. His name is Jealous, and we were, we've been talking about the heart of God and the status of God towards you right now. It's a really important word. It's a really important word, status. It also, it can be correlated to position, meaning something that's fixed. So how, how pleased God is with us is determined on how we exercise our faith. Because the Bible says this, faith is the only thing that pleases God. Why though? Because faith says amen to God's yes. And what God has said yes to, he also will do. So when you say amen to what God promises, you open up the door for him to come into your life. And when you do that, it pleases God because it pleases God to not only speak, but to perform what he speaks because he's faithful. And his word is exalted above his own name, which is jealous, but he wants to do what he says because he's a faithful person. He's a faithful God. And so faith is the only thing that pleases God because it says, have your way. Now, so I'm talking, so how pleased God is with you is not the same thing of as God's love towards you. It's not the same thing. God's love is agape, unconditional. It, ne it never changes. That's why he loves the person who's going to hell as much as he loves the person who's sold out for him. For God so loved what? The world. He's the propitiation of our sins, not our sins only, but the entire world. He loves the entire world with an everlasting love. However, he is not pleased with the world. He says this, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be friends with people who are in the world, but James is talking about the three things that John is talking about, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you're friends with that, that's everything in the world, and you're attached to it. You can't walk with someone unless you're agreed with them, the Bible says. If you're agreed with the world, that means you're walking with the world in the lust thereof and you cannot be a friend of God at the same time because the world is at enmity or against God, okay? So this is talking about the pleasure that God receives from you and me. We determine that. How we respond to Jesus' love is how we please God. It's not a works-based thing. It's a response based on how much we realize God loves us, the revelation that we have of God's love, okay? And how much we allow that to flow through us. God's love, his status, his position is unchanging towards us. We sang it earlier, how he loves us. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the love of God that Christ died for us while we were dead in our trespasses. Literally, we, we didn't offer God anything. In fact, our, our works were stench to God. They were filthy, and yet he died for us because he loved us. Okay, So I'm talking about the status of God. The name of God is jealous over us. Now, God loves the world, but he's not jealous of the world in the way that he's jealous of the church because he's not married to the world. He's the bridegroom of the church. Okay, so before we go into this entire night, we need to, first of all, the scripture that, over, that presides over this entire night is Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. It says this, For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. 
So God is a jealous God. And Proverbs says this, chapter 27, wrath is cruel and anger a torrent. But who is able to stand before jealousy? If you're wrathful, you'll do crazy things. If you're angry, you'll do crazy things. But if you're jealous, you will do crazy things. The world has a counterfeit jealousy and people who are jealous in the world are crazy. You will do crazy things as a jealous person in the world, like, like psychotic, psychotic jealous things, like crazy. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. We always talk about it in, in, in the world. We're talking about jealous ex, ex-girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, stalking psychotic things. Because jealousy, who can stand before it? Wrath is bad, anger is, is a torrent, but jealousy consumes, okay? So let's, let's, let's make that known, that jealousy is something to be, is not, something not to be messed with. So God... He is jealous. His name is jealous. Now, did you know one of the Ten Commandments is not to covet your neighbor's goods, your neighbor's wife, all these things. It's jealousy over someone else's whatever it is. That's wrong. But did you know that it is not only right, but godly, to be jealous over a husband, over a wife. It's right. A husband, go ahead. A husband, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this because I'm gonna explain this, so I'm just I'm saying this straight up. It is godly for a husband to be jealous of his wife, his wife's affection, his wife's heart, his wife's body, his wife's life. Why? Because Paul writes and says, wives, submit to your husbands and give to him your, give, you don't withhold from him. Why? Because your body isn't yours, it's your husband's. And husbands, lay your lives down and wa- love your wives and don't withhold from her anything because your body isn't your own, it's your wives. Remember in Genesis, the husband shall leave the household of the father and the two shall become one. Okay, you don't own yourself anymore. You are your wives and your wife is yours. And Paul writes and he says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and you are not your own? So this is all prefaced and premised upon God's relationship towards us. And then from this place, this is where everything comes out of. Now, what is marriage? Marriage isn't man's idea. Marriage is God's plan. It's between a man and a woman. That is marriage. Anything else is counterfeit, even if it's called marriage. Did you know that there are occult people and cults out there that talk about Jesus, but they're talking about a false, false, fake Jesus? It's not the same Jesus. Ma, the, the Muslims are like, we believe in Jesus. I'm like, no, you don't. You don't believe in Jesus. The, the Mormons are like, oh, we believe in Jesus. I'm like, no, you don't. You don't believe in Jesus. You can wrap whatever you, whatever you want to and paste the word Jesus on it. It ain't Jesus. Because Jesus is who he is. You can call me Todd. I'm not Todd. All right? Forever you could call me Todd. I'm not Todd. My name's Anthony. But you can call me Todd. But I'm not Todd. You get what I'm saying? You don't change my, I can call a tree a car. I can call a tree a car. It doesn't make it a car. I can call myself a woman. It doesn't make me a woman. Listen. What I'm saying is, we are in an age, and, and I'm saying this corporately, because we have to stand for truth corporately in a way that we might present truth different privately. 
okay? So I might walk with somebody who claims these things and I might walk with them for a time to help them and to nourish and nurture them and to actually be filled with grace and truth. But when it comes to being in a corporate public standpoint, you can't say this or that. You can't submit yourself to a greater claim because what you're doing is you're subscribing to what's behind the thing. Does that make sense? So I'll talk about I'll talk about um, I'll talk about society issues in a way that seems almost um, cold. You have to publicly, and here's why: I've seen people who have been pastors of worldwide churches compromise on a public platform about something that they should have stood firm on, been firm like flint, forehead like flint, back backbone like steel, and yet they said well, you know, we just need to talk to them a little bit. And because of that, I saw multiple interviews of big name people that you would all know. And I saw interview and chronologically, I knew that because they opened the door here and they didn't stand, they would not, they would not stand here and they didn't. And they wouldn't stand here and they didn't. And they wouldn't stand here and they didn't. And guess what? They fell. As a watchman, I watched and I said, God, he's headed for destruction. Because how can you be arrogant to say this is true, to say this is true when this says otherwise? If you read the Bible and you read words, it'll seem so cold. If you read the book of James, what? It sounds like he's like, and he's like shooting you with the word of God. And it's like, oh my goodness, I have a, I have a brother that I love dearly. And he always said this, definitions have no grace in them. A definition has no grace in it. It is what it is. It's truth. So when you read the word of God, it's like, and it's meant to cut you that way. But then when you deal this way, you ought to be cut. And then this way, privately with people, you look at Jesus and how he dealt with people. Now you always discern if somebody is coming from a place of a Pharisee or a place of, of, uh, of the sinner. Okay. Jesus dealt with people very differently. He had the same message. He never changed. If you remember the temple, he talks about where there's the Pharisee and he said, God, I thank you so much that I'm not like that sinner over there. I paid my tithes. I pray every day. I do these things. I serve you in the temple. I am good. And the sinner is banging his chest. He's like, oh God, help me. I'm a sinner. I need mercy. And Jesus said, the one who bangs his chest is the one who receives mercy. I didn't come here for the healthy, but I came here for the sick. Did you know when he says healthy, it's a, it's a, it's 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 a, it's a, it's it's all it's. He doesn't actually mean that. The Pharisees weren't healthy. How do I know? Because he said, you are washed on the outside, but on the inside, you're filled with dead man's bones. You're a whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you're clean. On the inside, you're filthy. And, he, and, he, and then he said that to the Pharisees and he turned to his disciples and he said this. He said, if your righteousness doesn't surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees, neither will you enter the kingdom of God. Do you know what he just said? Subvertently, indirectly to the Pharisees, you're going to hell. That's what he said to the Pharisees. And we're like, oh, Jesus was so kind. And he's like, yeah, he was kind. But to, to those who were full of pride, he resisted them strongly, strongly. He pushed back against them. If you look at the rebukes of Jesus all throughout the gospels, he rebuked Judas in a way he didn't rebuke Peter. And guess what? On a surface level, they did the same thing. Why? He knew the hearts of the people. If the person who was caught in the, in the act of adultery, the person who was banging his chest, the person who was blind, Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, had a different heart than the rest of the Pharisees. He wanted to know the truth. And so Jesus dealt with him differently, privately, than he dealt with Pharisees publicly. Are you getting what I'm saying? So I'll say drop, I'll drop bombs publicly and people will be like, oh, this, this, this. And then if I talk to you face to face, it might be a different story. Not in compromise, but in how I deal with you. And in a public platform and in a public place, we have to stand for truth in a way that looks harsh, but it's not. It's love. Amen. Okay? So, let's bring us back into this place of this. I said the marriage thing because, and I'm going to say this right now. Here's what I saw last year when I prayed. 
because we all live in the state of Minnesota, so we're subject to what's every, everything that's going on here. You know, a lot of times you can be subject to attacks in your life, and it's simply based on geography. Did you know that the Bible talks about the John the Revelator sending a word of God to the church in this specific area? And do you know that each one of those churches had an assigned angel over the region? And what was going on in that region was different from the next church and different from the next church and different from the next church. Regional. There are regional angels and the counterfeit is there are regional principalities. So did you know in, the, in Lakeville, in the city of Lakeville, there is a spirit of Leviathan over the entire city of Lakeville. Do you know, it's twisting the word of God. It's twisting the things of God. And it comes because it's Lakeville. Leviathan is a water serpent spirit in this area. And I've dealt with this thing over in all these different places. And now the churches in Lakeville, I've had to do the same thing because they're twisting and they're misusing and they're coming under manipulation and all these different things. So I'm just saying, sometimes the attacks that you have in your life are literally based geographically. Like, like where you live. Yeah. City. City. Oh my God. Neighborhood. It's yeah, it's true. It's just true. Neighborhood. Yeah. City. Region, state, nation, we're, continent. Like where we live in Lake, or on what, where we live, uh, when I looked out that window, what was like a month and a half ago, that's when I saw the eagle crushing my sister. Amen. Come on. And that's what God is doing. God is doing it. So here's, so, so, so that's, that's what's happening. And, um, and so, what I saw last year in 2020, I was in prayer and I saw a threefold principality that is coming against the state of Minnesota. And I dropped that marriage thing because of what God has been putting in my heart that is literally destroying not only the church, but people in the world. We think that we can be soft on sin to the sinner because we don't want to hurt their feelings. But in reality, if we peeled everything away, sin kills people. Sin eats people. Sin destroys people. And I'm going to come at sin with every amount of fire that I have. And people might feel like it's burning them because they're attached to it. And I'm going to burn it away and I'm going to speak to you like Jesus spoke to Peter. And he spoke to Peter, over Peter, behind to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. And to Peter, that might have felt like, oh God. But what was he doing? He was attached to the satanic agenda of the carnal man, which was don't send Jesus to the cross. So in the process, G Peter, who used a sword, needed to be cut by Jesus, who had the sword in his mouth. This, the word of God, so that it could sever from him the demonic things of the world and the, and the word and the spirit of God. So what I saw last year was this. I was in prayer. I, thought, I saw a threefold spirit that is actually coming against the state of Minnesota. And this is what it is. I saw, and it was confirmed immediately from a conversation that I had on the phone with a friend. When God speaks to you, he will confirm his word. It says, by out of the mouth of every two, or out of two or three witnesses, shall every word be, what, established. God confirms his word with signs, wonders, and miracles. I was at the gas station yesterday buying some cottage cheese. I love cottage cheese. Thank you, Jesus, for cottage cheese. I eat cottage cheese. I was, uh, yeah, so good. I used to not like it and then I did it. you know what when someone forces something on you in life you actually tend to go the other way when my parents I was forced cottage cheese mom I love you but cottage cheese was forced on me and I hated it I hated vegetables cottage cheese all these different things and then when I became mature I recognized that some of these things I actually didn't not like I just did it out of rebellion so I started eating these foods and I was like thank you Jesus do you know that sometimes there's things of the kingdom of God we don't like because because people have tried to force and manipulate them on us. And now when God is giving us sobriety and he's bringing us out of certain areas, we can actually see the truth and love what he loves. I have friends who don't like praying because of how they were taught. I didn't have a grid. So I was just like, I'm just going to pray. Sometimes it's harder to come out of legalism than lawlessness. It was easier for the sinner to come into the kingdom than the Pharisee. Yeah. So I saw this threefold spirit in prayer over the state of Minnesota. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And here's what it was. 
I saw the face. It was like a, a, it was the face of a person. It was mixed skin. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, the spirit of racism. Spirit of racism. It's an actual spirit. Okay, it's a spirit. You know, house shall be divided against house. Nation shall be divided against nation. People against people. Like literally the spirit of racism. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. I'm warm. But it's the fire of God. It's the fire of God. I, I felt it in my bones. And as I been, begin to release the, the word of God recently, the fire of God has begun to manifest. And literally I've been getting warm, like hot. It was a face of a person and it was a mixed skin color. And the Holy Spirit told me that it was the spirit of racism, okay? But this was all one person. So these three were interconnected, okay? You don't just deal with one thing, you deal with all of them. The second thing was this. I saw on this person's face that it had um, shadow, like it, was sha like it was shaven, right? It had shadow, but I knew that it held itself as a female. So it was, the, it was the spirit of transgenderism. Now, here's the interesting thing about this though. It's not about sex and gender, it's about order. It's about God's created order. And that's why I'm talking about marriage. It's so highly sacred in God's sight. It's not about what you do and don't want. It's about honoring the covenant of God that he set from the foundation of the world. It was a transgender, I don't know, it's a, it was a transgender man who wanted to be a woman, okay? The third thing was this, its hair were snakes. And they were snakes and they would, it was Medusa, which is the spirit of Jezebel. So spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of transgenderism and the spirit of racism connected all in one camp and that's what the principalities over Minnesota and we are actually seeing I saw uh, an article last year uh, in a in a public library in the state of Minnesota these young kids someone was in there wearing drag and you couldn't tell what they were like a it looked uh, their outfit was just perverse and they were teaching kids in this book sexual things acts and things like that do what you want be what you, and it was for kids who were like five four five six that is the spirit that is a spirit behind that and we're like oh it's you know people are like well they're public it's public ground they can do it and it's like really did you know that in the founding of this nation, did you know there were no jails or prisons? Did you know the church actually created jails so that people who had continuous issues, they would put them in there and while they were in there, they would preach the gospel to them? But then we relinquished that system to the government Thank you. And when that government took it over, we started having problems. You know, the education in the beginning of the nation was Christian education. And then we let the government take it over. And when the government took it, then all this, all of our spiritual and Christian literally foundings were wiped away. Did you know that we tell in the family was in the beginning and it was a man and a woman. And now we've let the government make laws in the society. And now all of a sudden it's like all of our world is in chaos and people are in depression and drugs and addiction and suicide and we wonder why we're dealing with these things don't look at the fruit look at the root and when you deal with the root people get offended because it challenges the core of who they are and what they believe so after I saw this vision I was disturbed because it was a disturbing thing because it was proud it was haughty it was it was it had this attitude of like um, I can't be touched Medusa's hair. So I had this phone call right after. And a friend of mine called, uh, we were on the phone. And I brought up this vision I had. And he goes, wait, what'd you say about the hair? And I'm like, it was, uh, it was like snakes. So it was like the hair of Medusa. He goes, I just got done listening to a sermon. 
and the pastor referenced Medusa in the sermon. He's like, I haven't heard that word spoken in a long time. And the Holy Spirit bore witness with me. He said, son, the vision you saw concerning your state is true. So, why do I say all this? Because I'm showing the products in the natural world of where we've gotten it wrong in the spiritual realm. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the order of God, God's created purpose, okay? God has always been speaking to us about marriage since the very get-go. In his scripture, from the beginning, right? It's not good that man should be alone. Out of man, he created woman and he created them, male and female. And in the, in the day that he created them, he called them male and female and the two should become one. That was, and they should bear fruit and multiply. Listen, you can't bear fruit and multiply if you are not a man and a woman. It doesn't work. If you're two men and two women, you can't bear fruit. It was one of the first commandments of God. It's not a matter of preference, it's commandment. Okay? The Bible says he commands all men everywhere to repent. That's a commandment. It's not like, if you, if you choose to, it's like, well, yeah, you choose, but like, it's a commandment. Why though? We're like, oh, it's burdensome. God just wants his way. No. <laughs> First of all, the commandments of God are not burdensome. But the full purpose why God commands us to repent is because he wants us to be with him forever. That's the commandment. And when he commands us to do something, it implies that he gives us the power in the commandment to fulfill it. That's why in the book of Mark, he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. In the previous passage, he says, he brought them to himself and gave, him, gave them power. And then he gave them a commandment according to what he gave them. And he says, freely you receive, freely you gave. Not according to your own works, but my power residing in you. So when God gives us a commandment, it implies he gives us the power to do it. Okay? And when he wants us to repent, it's because he wants us to be with him. He is a jealous God. His name is jealous. He burns. He broods. He looks over you. He's a refiner. He puts you in the fire because he burns. He wants purity to come from your life. He's always been speaking to us about marriage between him and us. If you look, oh, thank you. In the book of Isaiah, he's talking to the nation of Israel, Isaiah 54. He says, your maker is your husband. Your maker is your husband. Oh, Israel, your maker is your husband. Okay. Now we have to understand something because people might be like, oh, it's Israel. Yes, but there's more. The Bible says this, the old covenant is a shadow of the new covenant and the new covenant is built on better promises. And the new covenant says in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor man, nor woman. So in Christ, we are all one. And so now it's not just the Jewish nation that is the bride of Jesus. It is also the Gentiles that have been grafted in. And so we have received what the Jewish people denied. And so that the gospel could go to the Gentiles, you and me, and so that we would be grafted in so that we could be the bride of our maker. Isaiah 54, Matthew 25, Jesus gives a parable of the 10 virgins. It says this, that they, there was five who were wise and they were filled with oil. Their lamps were filled with oil. There were five that were unwise that wanted to buy the intimacy with God from the other five. And the five said, no, first of all, you can't do that. It's like me if I have a brother and I say, hey bro, have a good relationship with dad for us. That doesn't make any sense. You spend time with dad for me. You, you, you go out to eat with dad for me. You go play this with dad, go, go play, you know, basketball with dad for me. That doesn't make sense. And these five foolish virgins, they literally said this, hey, I want some of your oil, aka the oil represents the infilling of the spirit, which is fellowship, intimacy with God, communion with God. They're like, hey, give us some of your communion. And you know what the five wise ones says? Uh-uh, go buy your own. Go get your own oil. We actually spent time for this. We sowed for this. We, we, we planted ourselves for this. We endured. We were crushed. Did you know oil comes from olives and olives come from the place of pressing, crushing, and that's done in the secret place. 
oil, intimacy. And then it says this, when they heard the voice, hallelujah, when they heard the voice of their bridegroom, they trimmed their lamps, AKA the fire came and lit the oil. And while they were going in, the other ones were too late. Now, this is a whole message in itself, like missing the moment. That is a, it, that is a throat, like Adam's apple in the throat, soul in the throat type of message. Yeah. Esau sought repentance with tears but couldn't find it. Judas sought repentance with tears but couldn't find it. Too late. Yeah. This is why this is a powerful word. Ephesians 5.22 Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, Love your lives. Love your wives. <laughs> Love your wives. Love your wives. How though? Listen to this. As Christ loved the church. So we might be like, oh, Christ laid his, down, his life down, which he did. Ephesians 5.22 goes on to say that. He laid his life down. He gave himself for her. But you got to understand, when Paul is writing that, Paul draws parallels constantly. Do not be filled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. He draws these parallels. So husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, a.k.a. Christ is husbands, wife, church. Jesus is the bridegroom to the church, which is the bride, which you and I are the members of. So as a whole, we are members of the bride of Jesus. That's what Ephesians chapter 5 is talking about. And so Paul is drawing these parallels between this type of relationship and this type of relationship. He's saying, listen, you have to first understand how Christ loved the church in order, husbands, for you to love your wives. Because he says, just as Christ loved the church, laying himself down for her, giving himself a ransom for her. And that's where we have it messed up in society as well, is where men are looking to women to do the roles that men are supposed to be doing. Ahab was supposed to be running his kingdom and he was lackadaisical, lazy, passive. He sat back. So then what did Jezebel have to do? She had to come forward and she had to take Ahab's role. We're always like, Jezebel, Jezebel, Jezebel. And it's true. The spirit of Jezebel is nasty. But if Ahab would have manned up, he wouldn't have given opportunity for her to take his role. Yeah. Men are like, ah, oh, women, this, you know, this, this, this. Men. You're the head. You determine. You set the bar. You're the priest. I'm, there's no men here. Men, you're the head. You're the, you determine. You're the priest. You set the bar. You literally are the covering for women. Christ is the head of the church. He's the head covering. Men, you're the head of the marriage. You're the head covering. And wives, you come under and trust your husband as a leader, as a head, as the priest. Men need to stand up in this time. And as much as God is raising up powerful women, he's raising up powerful men to be able to steward these powerful women. A lot of times these men, men in, the, in the culture have been passive, weak, Ahab spirit, and they don't know what to do with powerful women, so they step back. You know, we have something over our state called this Minnesota Nice. It's been branded. I talked about it last year. Minnesota Nice has been branded. And we think it's a good thing. No. It's not. Do you know what it is? It's passive. It's passive. Mm -hmm. Passivity. Do you know what the original definition of nice is? Stupid. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh the original definition of nice is stupid. Minnesota, stupid. Yep. Are you guys getting the point a little bit about this marriage thing? It's important to God. Revelation chapter 21, the new Jerusalem. And I saw the new Jerusalem coming out of the sky, the heavenly city, the, the, the new Jerusalem. And it says this, the new Jerusalem is the wife of the lamb. Okay, the wife of the lamb. But who is going to be in the new Jerusalem? Who is the inheritance of Jesus? Did you know in the, in, in the, um, even in Eastern world still, when you give to a, get to a certain age, the, um, a man will... The, the family will find a wife for the man, right? And a man for the wife. It's arranged. Did you, know, did you know Jesus has an arranged marriage? 
It's with his bride, the new Jerusalem, those who are saved. It says that we are his inheritance. He wants to, not, not just a city. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the ruler of the nations. He's the creator of the cosmos. He doesn't need another town. What God wants is a people who occupy a place with him forever. He wants us to rule and reign with him. It says this, if you are children, if you are sons, then you're heirs. You are co-heirs with Jesus. Do you know Jesus inherits all these things from God the Father? But do you know what Jesus wants us to inherit? Everything with him. The same place with him forever. We will rule and reign with him in the millennia the thousand year reign, he says this, I will give you a rod of iron to dash the nations into pieces. I will give you the place to sit with me on my throne. I will make you the head of many places and many cities. You've been faithful with this. I will make you ruler of many cities. Jesus wants to actually give us his inheritance so that we're co-heirs with him. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. This is who God is. And then we're getting into this part. And this is where, when I wrote this message, I was like, oh God. Did you know in Jeremiah chapter 3, first of all, I got to say this. God relates with people now differently than he did in the Old Testament. Here is why. One simple word. Covenants. 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 Simple word. In the law of Moses, in the covenant of Moses, God operated on a do good, be blessed, do bad, be cursed system with the nation of Israel. If you do good, you're blessed. If you do bad, you're cursed. That was the covenant of Moses. Before there was a covenant with Abraham, do you know how God dealt with people? Cain murdered Abel, and God put a mark on Cain so that he wouldn't be destroyed. God working with people outside of a covenant, his nature was mercy. His nature was mercy. That was how he operated outside of a covenant. Because he hadn't made a covenant between... Why do you think in the book of Job, Satan could enter into the courts of God? Because there hadn't been statutes, laws, decrees, declarations, um, um, principles, law, uh, covenants made to seal heaven, the first heaven, the second heaven, the third heaven, from the enemy. So the devil would go into the courts of God where he actually can't go now. And he used to go accuse people, namely Job, to God in the courts of God, where God would draw all these heavenly hosts and Satan would come up and, and join them. And he would accuse Job to God. Now he can't do that. So he accuses you and me, the accuser of the brethren. He comes to us and he accuses us because he knows Jesus, in, the, in that time, Jesus hadn't become... Um, basically our propitiation yet. He didn't become our lawyer, the one who stands in the gap for us, our intercessor. So because of that, there hadn't been all of this binding material against the devil, which is why in the Old Testament, God never talked about demons, rarely ever. He rarely ever talked about demons in the Old Testament. Why? Because the people of the Old Testament didn't have power over demons. Because Adam and Eve gave it away to the devil. And it had to be restored through the second Adam. What the first Adam gave away, the second Adam had to restore. And so when you had the Old Testament, when they had people of rebellion, Samuel said it's as the sin of witchcraft. And if children were rebellious over and over and over, they would actually bring them before councils. And if they didn't repent, or get right, they would actually kill them. Same thing with homosexuality. Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't see America being burned up with fire and brimstone right now because God deals with us differently now. So when Jesus came and he became the lawyer, 
God's the judge. Jesus is now the lawyer. The Holy Spirit's the witness. Three agree in heaven. The Father, the Son, the Father, the Spirit, and the Word. That's what John talks about. And on earth, three agree as one. The Spirit, the water, and blood. And Jesus came by water and blood. So the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And that is the testimony on this earth. The witness of men is not as great as the witness of God. And this is his testimony that he sent his son. And that bears witness here on earth. And we have that witness in ourselves. You don't need to ask Joe Schmo if you're saved. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will bear witness in you that you are saved. And so people have all this kind of confusion. Am I saved? Am I not saved? What this? I heard this and this. And it's so much confused teaching out there about it the spirit bears witness on the inside and he gives us witness meaning i testify so god is the judge jesus is the lawyer the spirit is the witness now the interesting thing is the courts of heaven are rigged in your favor because the lawyer is interceding for you as the as as the one who is on trial As the one who's on trial, your judge is a righteous judge. Your witness is the spirit of truth. And Jesus is the propitiation. And he is actually defending you. And so now when the devil tries to accuse you and he tries to say, you're this, you're this, you look to the judge and you say, in the courts, how am I? And God looks and he looks at you and Jesus is standing in the way. And he looks through Jesus to you and he says, you're clean. You're you're guilt free. You're righteous. You're restored. You're in the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit says, true, true. I'm the witness. True, true. And now when the devil tries to condemn you guilty, Jesus says, innocent. And God says, court adjourned. That's the courts of heaven now. So, (laughs) it's funny because, you know, we, we, we have so many of these issues in our society, but we actually look back and we see they're not new. Okay? If you look at Exodus, or if you look at Jeremiah chapter 3, the Bible actually says that God gave Israel a divorce, a divorce certificate. Let me read it. Jeremiah chapter 3. It says this. Then I saw, verse 8, Jeremiah. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Listen, this isn't like the message translation, the amplified. This is like the King James, New King James. Okay, ESV gave her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. He's talking about marriage. God can't divorce someone he hadn't married. Do you remember when he looked at Jerusalem and Jerusalem was laying in the wilderness as a babe, naked, bloody, and God grabbed her and wiped her and swaddled her. And then all of a sudden when she was raised up, he saw her in beauty and adorned her and actually took her as her own, his own. God married Israel. Because Israel had played the harlot, God sent Israel a certificate of divorce. It doesn't end there though. So it came to pass, listen to this. This is talking about Israel. Now this is, I'm talking tonight about what can get in the way between us and God. It's not God. We get in the way of ourselves between God. That's what gets in the way. So it came to pass through her, Israel, through her casual harlotry, Okay, stop there for a second. Casual, harlotry, lackadaisical, common, normal. That she defiled the land and committed adultery, listen, with stones and trees. And yet, for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in 
pretense, says the Lord. Meaning, you can have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. You can say one thing with your lips and be far from God in your heart. To play the harlot is, in, is to engage with other false deities. It's to literally commit fornication, or in other words, spiritual intercourse with false gods. Now, if we think about it this way, it actually brings a sobriety to what we do. Because if we're married in the natural, we have a constant awareness of a physical relationship. But sometimes we get it backwards and we actually say, because God is spirit, I can get away with these things or do these things because it doesn't really, does it really affect, does it really affect anything? But this is the deceit of the enemy that we think we can casually play the harlot with God and not be affected. Remember what I said in the beginning? It doesn't affect God's love. It doesn't affect God's love. It affects how we are to God. Okay? So, now here's the interesting thing. Jeremiah says this before I just read what I read. They say, quote, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? God says, would not that be, would that not be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. Did you know God didn't break his commandment that says, thou shall not divorce. Because Paul gave basically one instance, sexual immorality, adultery, was actually just cause for divorce. So Paul, speaking of divorce, is actually also alluding back to what happened with God and the nation of Israel. God had a just cause to divorce Israel because Israel was literally spiritually having intercourse with other gods. Gave him just cause to divorce Israel. Now he says this, if a man returns or if a woman returns, if a man returns to her, is that not polluted? And yet, listen to what God says. Return to me. Return to me. Now here's, the, here's an interesting thing. God had forewarned Israel about this plenty of times. In Israel still did not heed to the voice of God. In Exodus, which is before Jeremiah, it says this, but you shall destroy their altars. God is talking about going into a new land. He says, but you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other God. You shall bow down before no other God. You shall not exalt. Because to bow down is to exalt. When you go low, something else is exalted. You shall not exalt any other gods. Why? For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now here's what would happen if you did not destroy altars, break pillars, cut down wooden images. Lest... And this is what it goes on to say, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and play the harlot with their gods. And what happens is that your sons and daughters will do the same. Now, God warned Israel of what they ended up doing. 
He gave them clear depiction. But this is a modern, this is revelation to the modern church. God is moving us from glory to glory. God is bringing us forward. And he says this, presently, if foreign altars are not destroyed and sacred pillars are not broken and wooden images are not cut down, meaning you don't burn the ships, meaning you don't get rid of everything that is not of God, meaning if you hold just this little thing here, if you hold just this little thing here, what will happen is you will make a covenant with that thing. A covenant is a very serious thing in the eyes of God. It's way beyond a contract. It's actually, it actually implies being blood cut. So Jesus cut a covenant with the New Testament church by his blood. So when you make a covenant with something, you are actually joining yourself to that thing. Okay, so Jesus, his blood cut a covenant for us to enter into. And when we drink his blood, the Bible says, we receive his covenant. Okay, when you don't break altars and when you don't cut down images and when you don't destroy altars and break down um, um, pillars, meaning there's things in life that can be idols, and if they are not dealt with harshly, this is implying harshness, okay? If they're not dealt with harshly, what will end up happening as a result is you will make a covenant with those things and you will join yourself with them and everything that they are will start to enter into your life. And it's not God doing it. It's actually us opening a door to these specific things. I actually listened to a message last night and today of this guy who came out of the new age into Christianity. And he was doing all, all types of psychedelic drugs, which the Bible calls pharmakia, sorcery, Tower of Babel, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? He was doing these drugs. He induced spiritual encounters. Actual presences would come, but in the end, they would steal from him in many ways. They stole his sleep. They stole his relationships. They stole his money, obviously. They stole his sanity. They stole his relationships with other people. They stole from him. But he didn't know why all these things were happening. And this is what he said. And I thought it was so interesting. This was a guy, I just came across his video last night. And I started watching it and it actually played into what I was already going to speak about today. He said that when he would have these terrifying encounters, he would justify doing more of these things by saying, in the end, it was actually a good thing. It was, a, it, it was enlightening. You know, it was like, it was duality. It was, you know, I can't have good unless I have the bad. You know, I can't enjoy joy unless I have, you know, misery. I can't, I can't see light unless there's darkness. Did you know this is the doctrine of modern occultism? Yeah. Duality. You can't have God unless you have the devil. And so they see the devil as a counterpart of God, an anti or, or, or an opposite. It's not true. Anti simply means against. It doesn't have anything to do with rank. The devil, the Bible says, is under our feet. He's not even close to being equal with God. Not even close. But he talked about having these bad things happen in life and justifying their presence in his life because they somehow taught him a lesson. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does God make somebody sick to teach them a lesson? Nowhere. Did you know that John actually speaks 
to his beloved Gaius and he says, I pray that you may be prosperous in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Do you know that's the Holy Spirit speaking to us? I wish that you would be in health just as your soul prospers. God wants us healthy. There is a false doctrine going out that is attaching itself to the prosperity gospel saying God doesn't you know people are rapping on this prosperity gospel and they're saying prosperous and healthy God wants you blessed and healthy like all these things like oh this is anti and so they're embracing poverty and sickness and the pendulum is swinging now here's the middle ground God does not want us to value riches over his presence there is a rebuke in the New Testament that says you are rich and yet in you are poor naked blind and wretched okay it's the priority but in the old testament and in the new testament it says that he will provide for us according to his riches and glory abraham he said he make him great great in wealth but he brought him to where his heart was in the right place solomon asked for wisdom and god blessed him beyond measure you don't think that God wants to bless you financially? It's not about that. It's about your heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How exalted is treasure? If your treasure's in the heavenly places, there you will be. And if your heart's there, God will get you treasure because your heart isn't consumed with mammon. It's consumed with the kingdom of God. So God can trust you in that place and it flows right through you. I believe absolutely God wants you to be prosperous and absolutely God wants you to be healthy. It says this, the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to give life and life abundantly. The Bible says the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. And it says Jesus was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And how did he do that? He went about doing good and healing all who what? Who were oppressed by the devil, implying sickness is an oppression from the devil. Doing good and healing all, releasing them. Sickness is an oppression from the devil. Health, healing, prosperity of soul and body is from God. Prosperity in your finances is from God. And it's all about the position of the heart. It's all about that. But what ends up happening is if we think naturally, we'll go from God wants you, and, and, and the gospel is all about you getting rich and healed instead of loving Jesus. And then when people see that, they'll swing to the other side and they'll say, the gospel is all about you being basically poor and sick. And I'm like, that's wrong. Yeah. If you're going to preach that it said he became poor that we might become rich. If you're going to preach against what Jesus said, he went, doing, went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And you're going to promote sickness. You're going against the word of God. You're going against Jesus. So I'm right in the middle. I believe in a sound heart and everything else is added to you. Prosperity, health, blessing that will overtake you, all these things will be added to you. Now there's a love of money that runs rampant and people try to twist scripture and all that. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that Jesus wasn't impoverished do you know how I know that? When he was a baby, he was showered with great wealth, frankincense, gold, and myrrh. From his very birth, he was blessed. The Bible says that nine women, I believe it's, I believe it's nine. Oh no, it's in Luke chapter nine. Many women came and they supported Jesus financially in his ministry. He had enough finances to where he needed a money keeper. If you have $2 in your pocket, you don't need a money keeper. Does that make sense? So Jesus had, and in John, he says, if you have the world's goods and see your brother, you know, needing and you store up your heart, how is the love of God in you? Meaning that it's not a wrong thing to have. It's a wrong thing to clutch. That's wrong. Now, we're talking about we're, we're talking about the truth. We're talking about what Jesus wants for us. We're talking about how Jesus is jealous. He's a jealous God, meaning he is so jealous over your thought life, your thoughts. 
He's jealous over the intentions of your heart. He's jealous over your time, your resources. He's jealous over your speech because he gave you a tongue to speak. He's jealous over your intimate fellowship. And, and he, is, he is jealous over your body even. Because your body is a temple and it's not yours anymore. It's God's. It's not even the devil's. He's jealous over it. Did you know that what God is jealous over, he fights with an intensity that is dangerous to whatever stands in the way that he's jealous over. Dangerous. The devil stood in the way of Jesus and his bride and he came and utterly destroyed the devil. Utterly. Not only did he destroy the devil going around and, make, and healing all these things, but he replicated himself. He duplicated himself in his disciples. And he said, we are going to have vengeance on the devil. And how I'm going to do that is I am going to give you what I have. And you're going to go and you're going to give to others what you have. And they're going to go and they're going to give to others what they have. And we are going to go and we're going to all do works. And you're going to do greater works than me because I go to my Father and the Spirit of God and might and counsel will come and you will wreck the devil's playground. You will destroy his kingdom. God does not like the devil. He doesn't play with him. He doesn't play. And when we play the harlot, we play with the devil and we think it's innocent. It's not innocent because it's not a matter of God loving us. We simply open doors did you know that you have the power to open doors in your life? Did you know the spirit of worship? Isaiah 22 is the key of David. And that key opens doors that no one can shut and shuts doors that no one can open. Did you know that God has given you authority? Because he says, I have been given all authority. Now, therefore, go. What does that imply? He gave us authority. Did you know that if we use the spirit of worship and we pervert it, meaning we bow down, meaning we exalt other gods, meaning we go below them and we open ourselves up to them, that they actually, we open a door and they come in. It's not God, it's us. And I hate the spirit, a twisting spirit that tries to make us have responsibility of what's not our responsibility and tries to make us release responsibility for what's ours. It tries to make us say this, crucify demons and cast out flesh. You can't crucify demons, you cast them out. And you can't cast out flesh, you have to crucify it. Meaning God wants us to have a sober mind. This is your responsibility, this is not your responsibility. This attack that's coming against you, that is not your responsibility. What your responsibility is, is to su submit to me. Stay underneath me, and when you stay under me, you will resist. And then when you resist, that devil will flee from you. Your responsibility is to stay in me. And I, the Lord, I will fight for you. And the devil will come in one way, and the devil will stay scatter seven ways the bible says yeah. Yeah. how when you submit to god when you stay under his covering and you abide in him the devil cannot touch you john says this the righteous abide in god and the evil one does not touch them yeah. doesn't do it he has no access. It's like there's this force field and he can't quite break through because the blood of Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit is like a waterfall. It's like a covering. And when you stay abided, it covers you and you abide in it and it abides in you, the anointing. And the anointing breaks every yoke of bondage. And when you're underneath the covering, the devil can't come in. Just as much as the third heaven is sealed to the Antichrist, right now when we're in Christ, where are we? We are in heaven heavenly places and he can't get in he is limited now underneath the third heavens to the place of the prince of the power of the air and when you abide in christ and you're in that place he can't touch you right. wow. so we need to discern a couple of things one attacks on your life you will be attacked the entire way jesus was attacked if he was not if he was subject to being attacked so are we he was tempted deeply in the wilderness. 
If he was tempted deeply, so will we be. But he says this in James. He says, when you are tempted, he said, I will provide for you a way of escape out of every single temptation. And when temptation comes, and it will come because the devil prowls like a roaring lion seeking whom he will devour. He looks for an opportune time when your heart is open to God. And when he looks in the spiritual realm and he sees God is about to elevate you from glory to glory, he will come in and temptation and try to keep you in the bucket. But when that comes, you recognize God is going to make a way for me out of this temptation and God will flee and you will become strong and mighty in God. Did you know when I used to struggle so deeply with sexual sin, literally on this device, I cursed the devil for, for pornography. I hate it with an, with an ever-living passion. It has destroyed men, and it has caused men to fall. It has caused women to fall. It has distorted our view of love and holiness. It has wrecked all these things. It says, it says uh, eagerly desire and pursue holiness, without which no one will see God. When we are shown other things, we don't pursue holiness, and the devil gets our eyesight, and I hate it because I want us to see God. I hate it. Yes. I hate it. You know, when I used to be tempted so deeply, I would, pr I would pray in advance. Do you know what I would do? I would pray after I sinned against God. Do you know what I would say? God, next time, give me a way and make it so clear. Help me to choose as well. Work in me to will and to do your good will, God. But do you know, I would have such a hard time praying in the moments of temptation and during temptation, and then immediately after I could pray? As, as if I got this burden off my chest. Jesus said, stay looking and prayerful, lest you, what, enter temptation. When you feel a, thank you so much, when you feel a desire to be prayerless, you come against that demon and you begin to pray. Because that's the very moment where he tries to come to lull you to sleep like David. When in the spring of the year, when the kings go to war, how do you war? In mighty in God. Your weapons are mighty in God for the pulling down of stronghold. When you are like David in the season when you are to war, the devil will come and say, don't use your weapons. Don't pray. Stay inside. Don't go to battle, mighty warrior. And when you do that, you will abdicate your responsibility. The Bible says, I was reading in the Bible, and it says, David sent. He sent. He sent. He sent, he sent, he sent. He abdicated all of his responsibility. And do you know when he did that, he gave room. And when he gave room, he fell. And when he fell, he played the harlot with other gods. And guess what it says? It says when you play the harlot with other gods, your children, your sons and daughters will do the same thing. Look at David's household, filled with idolatry. Solomon had over a thousand wives. Don't tell me that's not harlotry. He married wives of foreign nations. Harlotry. Why? Because of his father. Now, do you know in the New Testament, we deal with things sometimes because of our parents, but no longer do we have to suffer because we have the blood of Jesus that can break the bloodline curses. So I say in the name of Jesus, every bloodline curse that is in you right now and is coming against you, I sever it right now in the name of Jesus. I declare the blood to yes. It stops with you. Yes. It's the end with you. It's a new beginning, a new land. I'm going to tell you something pretty interesting. I was at a concert one time and I had an encounter with God. And I saw my ancestors on my Asian side of the family. And for generations, they all fell victim to the love of money. I saw generations. You know, when I was five years old, I had nightmares every time I would stay at my Asian grandparents' house. And here was the nightmare. I was in a dark place. And all of a sudden, gold coins began to follow me and crush me. They, would, they buried me alive. I was dying consistently, but I could never die. I wanted to die. Do you know the Bible says in the last day they will cry out for the rocks to fall on them? They will cry out for death, but they will not be able to find it. How can't you find death? 
In my dream, I wanted to die, but I couldn't because I was paralyzed because these gold coins fell on me and they, they trapped me. And as they trapped me, they were falling more and more and they literally were putting so much weight on me, they were destroying me. And then these missiles started coming and they started bombarding me and just literally coming and hitting me so hard. I was five. And then all of a sudden I looked up and I saw this hundreds and hundreds of foot tall man, huge belly, and he would go, ha, 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 ha. And this happened constantly whenever I stayed over, so I never slept overnight again. Now, until I was 21, 22 years old, I didn't know what that was. And then I found out it's the love of money, the principality. It was in the bloodline, a curse. You know that curse is over, that, over the nation of China. Greed, money, gold, dragons, it's all there. But do you know the buck stopped here? When I got born again, God brought me to train my soul out of the love of money in a pattern of thought. He broke me free in the spirit, but then he had to break me into renewal in the soul. And here's how. He caused me to go without money and to trust him to provide for me over and over and over and over. Did you know that in my life, I have, yes, in my life, I have written checks that I did not have money to, to actually back with. I wrote a check in faith and God actually allowed the check to go through on the other side and it was over $500 and it never showed up in my bank account. Why? Because he wanted me to be broken free from the love of money. Do you trust me, Peter? If you don't trust me, go into that fish. In the fish's mouth will be a gold coin. You worried about your taxes, bro? Go and fish and you'll open up and there'll be a coin and it'll be enough for you and for me. I'll provide for you. You tried to do everything that you know how to do to keep yourself secure and keep yourself sustained. You fished all night. I'm going to come into your life. Throw the net on the other side. And you're like, okay, I'm just going to try. And boom, Peter almost went underneath because of the prosperity and the increase of God. And Peter, who was so used to self-sustaining. Jesus was teaching him how to trust. He did the same thing for me. I drove in faith to my college one time, put the last of my money into my truck, $8.51, went to a gas station, 27, uh, went to the gas station, put the money into my truck. At the gas station, I calculated how much money $8.51 would get me in gas mileage, about 27 miles. I was on E, then I filled it up. I looked at how much miles it was from me to my school. It was 27 miles. I said, I'm going to drive. And no one knew I didn't have any money. Nobody. Why? Because I was prosperous in my soul. I stood. Did you know that you can, contentment isn't based on your circumstance? Godliness and contentment, you can be abased and have much, but godliness and contentment, it literally is not based on your circumstance. What does Paul say? I've learned, through, I can, I've learned to be content through all things. How? Through Christ who gives me strength. Christ will be your inheritance. Christ will be your provision. Christ will be your sustenance. Christ will make a way where there seems to be no way. So I drove to school, no money in my bank account. I literally have pictures on my uh, computer, on my hard drive, zero dollars everywhere. God told me not to work throughout the winter to plan my business for the next year. I said, God, I, I'm a money guy. You know, I'm a numbers guy. Like, do you see? He goes, trust me. I did. I even tried to get two other jobs and I couldn't. And he's like, are you going to trust me? I'm like, okay, yeah, I will. I get to school in faith. I'm, as I'm going, I'm declaring, I'm prophesying. I'm saying the word of God. I'm saying, Lord, you promised me this. And I passed this building. And one time God spoke to me when I passed this building. And he said that I would raise you up in a place that is, dry, that is flat ground. I would raise you up and I would raise you high like a building in, dry, in flat ground. I will, I will bring you up. But before honor comes humility. And you need to learn how to go low. And trust me, Anthony, you need to learn not to try to provide for yourself. Because if you try to provide for yourself, you stand in the way of God and his hands are tied. So I get to school expecting God to move. I was not going to tell a single soul. I don't trust God. As I'm walking in, a brother and sister, they're married. They say, hey, we have something to give you. And this is what I said. 
I know you do. Not arrogance, full confidence. She went into her purse, gave me an envelope, money. She said this to me, God told us to give this to you last week and we didn't. She didn't know I had zero dollars. Here's what happened after. The Bible says you don't put new wine in an old wineskin. You don't put supernatural provision into a system that's self-sustaining because it'll break. It'll break and that wine will go everywhere and the wineskin will be broken. So I had to be relinquished of my old wine, self-provision. And when I did, I changed. And when I changed, the provision came. And do you know, as soon as that came, I paid for gas to get back home and immediately checks started coming to me, immediately. And I looked at money differently. I said, money is not mine, it's yours, God. What am I saying? God did something in the spirit right when I was unctioned to break these curses. Now, going forward, God will break those things off your soul through renewal. When you renew your soul, you gut things. You can't keep altars and pillars and images. You gut, you burn, you destroy, you get rid of. It's a faith walk. And unless you let go and turn, God can't give you the new. He can't. He literally can't. He says you will only serve one master, either this one or this one or this one or this one. You can't serve two. You have to choose. And sometimes we play with the devil because of familiarity, because it's all we've ever known, because it's been old wineskin. But God is saying tonight, if you will forsake, burn, destroy, cast down these old things, I will give you everything that I have. I will make my covenant good with you. It says in Numbers, that there is a law of jealousy. Numbers 5.29, it says, this is the law of jealousy. When a wife, remember, us, you and me, when a wife, while under her husband's authority, remember how I said Jesus isn't jealous for the world the way he is for his bride? Because the world isn't his bride yet. He wants them to become, but they're not. He's not jealous for them. It's, that's, that's, that's the devils, okay? God isn't jealous over the devil. Jesus said to them, he said, you're the sons of the father, of your father, the devil. Listen, when they are under a husband's authority, when this wife goes astray and defiles herself, notice how it's not the husband that defiles her. Notice how it's not the devil that defiles her, that she strays and defiles herself. Okay? Because sin is born when you, are in, when you are drawn away by what? Your own desires and enticed. And when you're enticed, you open up a door and you conceive something. And when that thing gives full maturity, it's death. Okay? So that's our responsibility. All right? And I was saying this, when I used to be tempted so bad and I would pray after, I would defile myself. My body, you know that Paul said every sin is outside the body, but sexual immorality, you sin against your own body. People are like, there's no degrees in sin. Give me a break. It says literally, Paul says sexual immorality is the sin that you, you that actually you sin against your own body. It's super important to God. Very important. Because it plays into his first commandment. It plays into his created origin. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Numbers, when a woman, a wife defiles herself or when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man and he becomes jealous of his wife, then he shall stand the woman before the Lord and the priest shall execute all this law upon her. The man shall be free from iniquity, but the woman shall bear her guilt. 
Now this is the book of Numbers, talking about the law as well. But the premise stands that when we turn, go astray, we defile ourselves. And you have the power to choose life and death. If Israel had the power when they weren't filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost, when they weren't born again, then you all the more have the power. And it is a lie to say that I can or cannot do something. Listen, if you have opened up a door in your life to something that is not of God, God, by His Spirit, woos you back to a point where you can make the choice to close that door again. He will, make the tr he will cause you to be able to make the choice. He has given you the power to do that. And when you make the choice to break the idols, to destroy those things, and what do you do? You turn. Guess what? That door is closed again. If my people who are called by my name will what? Turn from their wicked ways and seek my face and pray, then I will hear from heaven and what? Heal their land. Their land. It's all about a choice in here. Choose this day. I'm liberating you to realize you have a choice. Did you know I, as much as I was messed up, I never had someone lay hands on me and do a deliverance. Never. Here's why. It's not that demons were in my life. It's I got a hold of John 8, 32. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Yeah. I got a hold of it. Now here's what I know. Knowing God is eternal life and that's intimacy. Yeah. Did you know Jesus said, I am the truth. So having a relationship intimately with Jesus will make you free. Did you know there were things that I was so plagued by, but because I ran to God, I didn't even know about this. I didn't know about any of the stuff that we do. I didn't know about it. But did you know that when you take dominion over your life by the Spirit of God, through obedience to Jesus, you are far more powerful and, and you are far more protected from the, from the schemes of the enemy versus having constant encounters, constant power moves. Here's how I know this. Peter wanted power so bad and then finally he got it on the mountain of transfiguration and Jesus said, that was amazing. You, you, there's nothing, you, you, you don't tell anybody about this. And guess what? Now we go back down. There is a knowing of Jesus that is in the heart of hearts that will not only make you free, but keep you free. And it is far better to not only be in health and to be free than it is to be healed and be delivered. Now here's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that healing and deliverance are not needed. God forbid me say that because Jesus went about and he delivered people. The gift of the Spirit is the gift of healings. The gifts of healings, okay? They're necessary. But what I'm saying to you is that when you come out of a place of being delivered, now you go into a place of being in dominion. The Bible says this to Adam and Eve, you shall have dominion over them, over the place I've given you jurisdiction. Okay? So now that Jesus has restored us to that place of fellowship with God, original intent, fellowship with God, he's saying the same thing to us. You shall have dominion over everything in your region. You shall have dominion over the devil. You shall have dominion over your thoughts. How? Taking every thought captive. You shall have dominion over your choices. How? Submit to God. You shall have dominion over what you give. How? Because of what you put inside of you. How? By the word of God into your heart and that out of a man's heart is the abundance of all these things. Now you don't make anything happen by working hard, but you do get into God's presence. And when that happens, everything begins to flow. So we're going into deeper places of freedom in Jesus where it's no longer manna to manna and manna to manna, but now it's 
into the promised land. Okay? Manna to manna is for a season. There's seasons where God will need to bring you from miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle to sign to wonder to, mer- to miracle, supernatural provision, and He'll do it your whole life. But here's what He's doing. In the process of that, He's helping you trust Him. He's trying to get Egypt out of you. Egypt, I work hard for my pay. I'm a slave to this. What I do is what I earn. I can only provide for me. God must have left me. He promised this so long ago. I got to fend for myself. I am, I am what I am. I can do this. That's Egypt. I'm not saying don't work hard. So right, right? people are like, okay, so I don't have to do anything. And it's like, no. I'm saying be in the middle. I'm saying receive God's grace and then out of that labor, never to attain for yourself, but out of response of receiving. That's grace. Grace will cause you to do more than you could ever do. And you don't strive. You abide. That's grace. It's hard for people though, because we all come out of Egypt. We all come out of this bondage. It's difficult. Sometimes it takes us going around the same mountain. But that's what God does. And then when he sets up in your heart the kingdom, instead of the kingdom of this world, but the kingdom of God, then at that point, he brings you into your promised land because your heart's been changed. And we don't talk about this a lot. Like in the church, we just teach principles a lot of times. We just teach principles and like what God will do. And that's great. But did you know the children of Israel never, never reached the promised land because they didn't know why God did what he did. They only knew what God did. The Bible says this, Moses knew my ways, the Israelites knew my works. The, knowing the ways of God is why God does what he does. So when God brings you through a trial and he brings you through a wilderness, you might look and say, I should have been back in Egypt. It would have been better for me in Egypt. You know, at least in Egypt, I was taken care of. At least in Egypt, I felt comfortable. Now out here in the wilderness, I don't even hear God. I'm out here with these people I don't like. I'm eating the same food every single day. I'm uncomfortable. I don't know what I'm doing out here. I want to go back to Egypt. I'd rather go to the old thing. It seemed easier. It seemed more comfortable. It was more predictable. It was more consistent. And now I'm blown about by the wind. I don't know where to go. I'm following this cloud and this fire. I don't even know where I'm going. Now what? I'd rather go back. That's the thoughts of our hearts sometimes. Why? Because we don't know God's ways. We don't see above and say, okay, looks like God's trying to get nastiness out of my soul so that when he blesses me, I don't make it destroyed. Because God wants to pour out his blessing on every single one of us. That's what he wants to do. He desires that all be saved. He desires that we all be prosperous, that we all be in good health, that we all live and honor our father and mother and have length of days. He desires these things. Now, I'm not saying the call to specific things in life. Like uh, there's there's people that I know that God bless them. They believe they're going to be martyred. Now, here's the thing. I think I'll try to be killed, but I don't think I'll die. So that's a different story. But length of days is a promise of God. Did you know that? It's the, it's the first commandment that comes with a promise. Honor your father and mother, so what? That it might be well with you and your days would be long. That's honor. Honor doesn't just mean, obe- it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not the same thing as obedience, right? Honor means to value. It means to value, to place proper value on them. If your parents told you to sin against God, you wouldn't do it but you can honor somebody without obeying them. They're two different things. Honor is a position of the heart. Obedience is an outworking action. See, God wants a cheerful giver. He wants us to be willing and obedient. He wants our hearts to be in it so that when we do it, it's not pharisaical. He wants us to do it in faith. That's the goal. So, this is, this is what God is after. God is after your heart because he's jealous for your heart. He's jealous your, for, for your affections. He's jealous. And he won't share you. God doesn't share like that. 
Proverbs says this, For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. Remember how um, David killed off one of his most loyal men? Because he abdicated his own responsibility. When you don't do and stand when God wants you to, it affects other people as well. It was, it was Uriah, the Hittite. He literally set him up, murdered him because he slept with his wife and then he tried to cover it up. And do you know Uriah was so faithful and honorable when David was dishonorable and he was deceiving, Uriah was committed to the cause and the kingdom. James says this, now, I'm setting a foundation, okay? I'm driving this down so that we can go up. Jeremiah the prophet says this, you will pluck down, you will root out, you will destroy, then you will build a plant. James says this, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself, thank you, makes himself an enemy of God. The enemy doesn't do it. God doesn't do it. When a person wants to be a friend of the world, he makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, yearning, jealous, calling, wooing, trying to find us, trying to, Adam, where are you? Jealous over us, reaching out, calling, saying, come back with me, come back to me. It's like the um, Song of Solomon, my beloved, my beloved, come, be with me. That's how the Spirit yearns for us. And he says, but, and then James is like, that probably hits you. So he says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So when you hear a message like this, when David was confronted by the prophet Nathan, and he says, this is what you have done. You have literally strayed in your heart. Do you know what David, he was resisted by God. His plans didn't work. Resist, 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 resist. And then guess what? That baby died. But do you know what happened? David, when he was confronted with the prophet's word, it was a riddle, a parable. And David was so proud, his heart was so hard that he couldn't hear straight truth. So a parable had to open up his heart. And then Nathan could hit him with the truth. It's you, you did that. And David fell down. And do you know what he said? I have sinned against the Lord. Do you know that he humbled himself? Rather, he was humbled. And God gave grace to him. He lifted him back up. Do you know that um, when Saul did a similar thing, Saul didn't repent, but he was in pretense, doing like what the, the treacherous and the nasty um, Judah did when Israel was doing what they were doing. Judah just kept on going. And Saul, he did not take seriously to the word of the Lord. And do you know what he did? He said, in pretense, Forgive me for the sake of my people, not between me and God. Forgive me for my reputation. Forgive me and make me right in front of this nation. And Samuel said, today, after Samuel walked away, Saul ripped his cloak and said, today your kingdom's torn from you. Did you know that David was caught in a very serious and similar thing? But what his, he did as a response was different. He was humbled and God gave grace to him. God resisted Saul and tore his kingdom away. And God gave grace to David and later called him a man after my own heart after he did these messed up things. Gave him grace, brought him high, made him one of the greatest kings ever. David played the harlot. And, and, and when we... When we do this, because, 
You know, the Bible is profitable for all things, doctrine, reproof, correction. It's, it's everything was written for us. When we do these things, and I'm talking like slight things, like your thoughts, your intents, the thoughts of your heart. Did you know the thoughts of your heart are different than the thoughts of your mind? Because the word of God cuts to the heart, judging and discerning the thoughts and intents of what? The heart, not the mind. The word of God will offend your mind to make manifest your heart because your mind can be a cloak to your motivation so many times. Your mind will tell you what you t ought to say, but your heart will be differing. That's why you can bless with your tongue and curse in your heart. So when we do this, we bring it all the way into the New Testament or at least into the Gospels. When Jesus talks about um, an, uh, when, when someone is, is ridded of an unclean spirit, Remember how I said if you abide in God, the spir a spirit will come and try to destroy you, but it, your enemy will leave seven times the way it came? Okay, remember that number seven. Because in Luke chapter 11, it says this, when you get rid of an unclean spirit, but you don't be, you're not repentant, you're just set free. You're not repentant. You're, you're pulled out of, but you don't turn to God. Did you know it's a f that's a false reality? Because the first elementary principle of Christ is repentance from dead works and faith towards God. They're linked in the same. Did you know repentance without faith? It's, it's a myth. It's a lie. It doesn't even exist. Which is this thing. When you are, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, the spirit goes through dry places seeking rest. And, he, and finding none, he says, I will return to my house ownership, my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order, cleaned up, orderly. Then he goes, and another translation says empty, but swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits. So remember when I said you abide in God, and you're filled, because to abide in something, if you abide in a pool, you stay wet. If you abide in Jesus, you stay alive. Because when you abide in him, what does he do? He abides in you, and your house is full. So when you move, move from that place of abiding, your house can be filled with other things. And the spirit comes back sevenfold, Seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there and the last state of the man is worse than the first. That's why without being filled with Christ and being filled with the Holy Spirit, like myself, I actually moved out of state, cut drugs, all these things. I went, my life was in order and guess what? When I was there, that spirit that actually tormented me, addiction and abuse and all these different things, it came and found me because spirits will travel across the land and they will go back to their house and I actually ended up worse, doing worse worst things in a foreign land because I tried to get away from them because I didn't get filled. This is what can happen to us when we're not submitted. It's not sufficient to be void of something because that's simply pretense. Repentance involves infilling. Okay? Peter says, repent and be baptized, and when you do that, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be filled. Repentance comes with infilling because it rejects the old and makes room for the new. Paul said it, don't be drunk with wine, turn from that, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, he, now here's Here's the good news. A righteous person falls and gets up again. The good news is that God didn't keep Israel in a divorced state. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. So if you 
have fallen into a category, which we all have, but if you presently have fallen into a category of what I just talked about, of having opened doors, as quick as you open them, you can close them. As quick as you turn, you can turn back. Forsake it, turn. Forsake it, turn. Break it, turn. Awaken, turn. Come out of that thing. Burn it. Forsake it. You know, uh, protection from God is found in His covenant. That's where it's found. Protection from these things. I'm not telling you something that I've never dealt with. Did you know I've dealt with demonic attacks and oppression many times in my life? More than I can count. More than I wish was real. But I have. And do you know how, how things first ended up? One time I walked down the stairs of my parents' house and the Holy Spirit said to me, if you look at the TV, you will open a door to the demonic realm. So I went downstairs and I didn't heed the voice of God. So I walked past the TV. Did you know TVs, radios, social media, all these things are voices, they're channels, they're mediums. Why do you think they call it channels? Why do you think they call it mediums? Why do you think they call it news? Why do you think they call it your feed? Because you actually ingest these things. That's why they call it that. They, they, it's, it's purposeful. Why do they call it channeling in the Bible? They call it medium. Saul sought a medium. Why, why do they say all these different things? Because it's actually hidden in plain sight. So I went down, right? It said, they used to say, we're going on air. But you know the devil's the prince of the power of the air? So we're reclaiming the airwaves, praise God, with what we're doing. We're reclaiming the airwaves. We're going live tomorrow with, with broadcast and with the Miracle House ministry, the circuit break and the Miracle House. And we're reclaiming the ground. We're reclaiming the airwaves. The, this, is our, this is our motto. We're disrupting the current of the age with perspective, truth, and entertainment. The current of the age. That's why it's called the circuit break because a circuit breaks current. The current of the age is the sway of the evil one. And he is the prince of the power of the air. That's why I looked on, on, on Instagram and I saw this video and it was all these major news sources and they would go from one thing to the other and actually someone took together a conglomeration of like 50 different uh, um, news sources all the same you know if it's like Fox or CNN or whatever and they took them from different states and they strung them together and they all said the same thing and they were talking about the danger of these mass medias swaying and manipulating the minds of people to push their agenda and it's one voice this and it's all of a sudden it's all these voices is added and this is the present age where it is dangerous for major news sources to put out information to try to sway the masses and this actually was from all these different states by the same news media source false prophets so what we're doing is we're getting on air Elijah wasn't afraid of the false prophets because he knew they didn't have the real fire he said let the God who answers by fire be God so we're bringing fire for the airwaves and that's what God has called us to do the spirit of Elijah in this in this day and in this age will literally stand in the gap and challenge the ways of the world and the voices and the streams of culture the currents of the age and will say no more Whatever your sphere of influence is, whether it's at work and you're literally there and you're beginning to revelate and you're stopping people in their tracks and you're saying, your thinking is going so, you're being pulled. Your mind is grasped by something and you're being moved like this. And I'm coming and I'm speaking to you of this revelation. And I'm saying, listen, this whole world is like goats and they're just under the sway and, and, and they're vulnerable and they're open and they are deceived. But when you're enlightened, you actually, by the truth of God, you can actually give clear consent. Vulnerability versus vulnerable. So wherever you are, you stand in the gap for God and you're a voice crying out. And that's the good news. The good news is that like myself, like sheep, we've all gone astray. 
I walked down the stairs, didn't heed the voice of God. I looked at the TV. It was that old movie, Paranormal Activity. It was on. And the second, listen, the second my eye touched the screen, boom, I felt all of a sudden protection from God was gone. Really? Same movie. So here's the thing. When you play the harlot like that, you create a covenant and yours is broken. You breach covenant. God never breaches it. When we are faithless, he is faithful. If we, you know, he, cause he cannot deny himself. So his covenant remains his, his covenant. Sure. It's in the blood of Jesus. We talked about it last week. The blood is set in stone. Even beyond that, the law is set in stone. The blood is actually poured out. But when we breach covenant, we open a door to a different covenant with different rules, different regulations, and a different person who sets the covenant rules. That's the devil. And his covenant is not friendly. He comes back on the back end and says, now you owe me. And Jesus said, freely, I give my life. So this is what happened. I knew a door was open. I was like, oh no. And I tried to pray it away. Oh no, 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 God. And he's like, Anthony, you just engaged. And I'm like, oh God, help me. I don't know what I just did. I went to bed. In the night, I had a dream. In the dream, I watched myself walk through my own house and I walk through my own house because paranormal activity is whole, all filmed through the cameras looking at people. In my dream, I watched myself from a camera's perspective in my house, which I knew that I was walking through. I walked out of my bedroom and I turned the corner and the camera angle changed. I walk into the bathroom, the door closed. I'm about to expose and destroy some of the devil's power in this place. I walked in the bathroom and as soon as I closed the bathroom door, I saw myself slammed to the ground thrown to the ceiling and then I woke up out of my dream and when I woke up out of my dream a devil was in my room and not just a devil the spirit of fear what does that lead to the spirit of bondage fear they lead to the same thing they paralyze you ever had sleep paralysis it's a spirit of fear unto bondage that's what it is people are like it's psychology and all these things no it's not so I was there, I saw the upper half, um, the upper half of a man and the lower half was a mist. And it began and I woke up as it was wrapping itself around me. And as it wrapped itself around me, this is like, this is, this is warfare, right? I'm telling you the tactics of the devil. It began to wrap itself around me like this. And as it wrapped itself around me, I literally, the room was getting darker and darker, literally. And as it wrapped itself more and more around me, I could feel my inner being and I could feel fear trying to press in so deeply, so strongly. You know, the interesting thing I was telling about that testimony with the guy who came out of new age. Do you know that when he was, he was being tempted by the devil, he said he felt this fear try to press against him and he said he gave up after a certain point and he opened and you know what when he opened and he stopped resisting that's when he started having all these dreams nightmares all these things happened happened to me i gave in i opened up i didn't heed the voice of god so this thing was wrapping around me i was it was trying to make me terrified and i couldn't move couldn't breathe couldn't say anything and it was trying to kill me like wrap me up in such fear. And what it was trying to do was come from the outside and go in. It was trying to get in me. It was trying to wrap me so much that I would just say, fine, give up. And it wanted to go inside. But here's what I didn't do. I did not let it. I didn't let it. And this is what happened. I sat there and I was, I was tormented, so tormented. And I sat there and I was like, And I felt on the inside, whoa. I felt on the inside, this fire, like a ball of fire. And I knew it was one word. And I felt it begin to move up my body and it was moving slow and I was digging, reaching, trying to get this out of me. And I was like, 
and it was moving up. And as it was moving up, I knew I had a decision. I could endure, like James says, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he is approved, he will receive the crown of life. I could endure it, or I could give up. I endured. And all of a sudden, it came and entered my mouth, Jesus! And when I said the name of Jesus, it was as if a snake that was wrapped on my arm was stabbed and it unfurled. And this spirit unfettered, unfurled, and it was blasted out of my room. And as I sat there, my room got tangibly light. Tangible light entered my room, starting with me and it went that way. And my room in the middle of the night was as if there was a light on. Because the Bible says this, this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So when you release light, darkness flees. And I went like this. <sighs> Fell asleep immediately. Peace of God. I started to learn to use the name of Jesus. Now I wish I could tell you that was the last time I've ever had demons in my room. It wasn't. I wish I could tell you it was the last time I was paralyzed in my sleep. It wasn't. But I will tell you this. When God puts a weapon on the inside of you and he gives you a testimony because no man gave it to you, no man can take it. And when you receive the blood of Jesus as your testimony, you overcome the evil one by it. And the devil comes back with the same tactics, but you use that ever change, never changing word of God. Now here's what I'm saying. Here's not what I'm saying. You have to be perfect. In this sense, you can never fail. Otherwise, X, Y, Z. Now, the, the scripture is riddled with scriptures that talk about us not falling or, or sinning. And that's possible. But what I'm saying is, I failed, but God taught me to close doors and to not let them be opened back up again. He taught me because I prayed. I was so sick of certain issues in my life. I said, God, show me what you see when I do this. And when I had a dream about him showing me what my sin looked like, I was I was, I was disturbed. God doesn't see things the way we see things. And we think innocent, casual things are okay. They don't make God love you less, but they do open doors. Yeah. Now the beautiful thing is this, like Exodus 34 says, if you break, you break covenant with these evil things, you say no more. You say, I'm done. You divorce them. And you receive the call of God back into that covenant. You'll be set free. You'll be protected. You'll learn your weapons. You'll overcome. Your life will be changed. So that's the benefit of a God who continues to love us regardless of what we've done whether it was or wasn't our fault the devil plays no games he's not he's, he's not partial he's impartial he wants to destroy his, a king as much as he wants to destroy a peasant he doesn't like human beings and God's not partial either so when we find out his word and we walk in it we can be set free and stay free because you'll, be, you'll know the truth and it'll make you free and the truth will keep you free. 
and, and, and I, I just encourage you and charge you, the Word of God breathed upon by the Spirit will be life to you and you won't want to sin. We get caught up because we still want to. But reality is we have desires for other things and we try to, we try to get our inheritance too soon. So, my final, my final words, this has been a, a, a long night and it's gotten into a point where we started high. I set a foundation and now I'm basically saying, from this place of sobriety, you have the power. You have the power. God wants you fully well. You have the ability to choose Him. What that does for your circumstances, that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to choose Him. And then what He does, that's His responsibility. So today, let's choose Him. Let's forsake all these things that occupy us. Let's burn them. Rid yourself of them. Re repent of them. Literally, finding out today these things turn and just say, God, I'm done with that. I want your heart. I've done this many times in my life and God has always taken me back. So let me pray. Let me pray for us corporately because this is not, you know, the, the God wants us, God can't build unless the ground is leveled. He can't plant unless the ground is tilled. Jeremiah the prophet couldn't build and plant until things were destroyed and taken down. He couldn't do it. And so my goal today was to, to destroy some lofty thoughts that said the devil's responsible for this when really we are. Because those are high and lifted up. Those are exalted thoughts against the knowledge of Jesus. And thoughts that say this is my fault when God says that's the devil. And then even more so, to say, I need to take this care of this in my life when God says, I will. So, from this place, I want to encourage you now to spend time with Jesus tonight. 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 Don't wait. Literally, let this be a fire in your heart to go be with Him. Because you saw, you know what His heart is. He's like, listen, I want to be so in love with you and you in love with me. I want to be so intimate with you. But when you turn and you're intimate with another, how can I share you? How can I be intimate with you? He says, turn away. I've been waiting. I've been calling. I've been knocking at your door. Just let me in and I will come and I will sup with you. I will be with you. So tonight, let this be a driver into your secret place. Even if you say, I feel like I haven't been there in a long time. Listen, there's no other way to get there other than to get there. Sometimes we just need to be sobered up. And we can think and know and see. You have the power. So Lord, I thank you. And I praise you for this word tonight, God. I praise you, Lord. I thank you that your testimony and what you've done in our lives, God, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus, what you have done for me, you will do for others. 
Jesus, what keys you showed me to use, you are teaching others to use those keys. And you're teaching me to teach others to use those keys. God, I thank you that because you have authority over all things in heaven and on earth, and we are in you and you are in us, we have your authority, God. And I thank you, Jesus, that we can tread on scorpions, that we can walk on snakes, God, that we can actually drink deadly poison and, and not die. Lord, we will not die before our time. Lord, we are sick and tired of allowing the devil to mimic ourselves and try to make us believe that we are the ones doing something when he is manipulating. And we're sick and tired, God, of blaming the devil for things that he wasn't even in our house when we were doing them. He was in a different region. He was in a different neighborhood. And he said, well, I'm glad that you think that I was the one that doing that and thanks for giving me credit but I was busy somewhere else God I thank you that the devil is a created being and he is not omnipresent so he is not everywhere at all times he seeks and he scours and he roams the earth and today God you're teaching us to stand against him as empowered sons and daughters of God so I pray Lord that a fire would be burning so hot in the hearts of every man and woman that is under the sound of my voice that they would would say enough yes. to the devil Lord you want so badly to do these things but you can't do it unless we allow you Jesus in your own hometown it said you could do no mighty miracle because of unbelief they shut up the doors they grieved the spirit and you were not able and the same reigns true today. You are not able to do in our lives what we hold locked in unbelief. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that mercy and grace would be multiplied to us that by your spirit you would open up our hearts God for us to turn to you and to say no matter the cost I want truth at all expense I can't afford to be stolen from anymore I can't afford to allow the devil into my house and to eat at my table and to watch TV with me and to sleep in bed with me I can't afford for the kingdom of darkness to steal my light today is when it ends today I choose life and I divorce death today Satan your reign is over in my life and I declare in Jesus name that I am a daughter of God yes. and I don't belong to you anymore I renounce you in Jesus' name. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I sever my ties and my covenant and my contract with you. I break down every idol you have presented to me. I destroy every altar I have set up to false gods. I renounce it. I burn it. I say, today, I am wholly yours, God, and you are wholly mine. And I pray that you would restore to me the joy of my salvation. Renew in me a clean heart. This is our prayer, God. And I pray for everyone who prays this prayer. That God, that you would come and you would abide in them. Many things are at our door, God. You're knocking and sin is crouching. I pray that you would help us to let you in and to keep sin out. Yeah. I bless these women of God. I thank you that this message is something to chew on. It's not just a drink. It's something to chew on, God. It's meat. It's getting into these deeper things. It's getting into authority and territorial demons and angels, God. It's getting into the authority that you have given us and, and into your name. It's giving us the understanding of the power of the truth and the abiding nature of your presence. It's giving us revelation into the power that you've given us. I pray that we would steward that power well. I bless you and I thank you. I pray a blessing upon this house for this house has received me, Lord, not just as a righteous person, but as a prophet. And Lord, I declare the reward of a righteous person and the reward of a prophet 
on this house, God. I thank you that the reward of righteousness is length of days, soundness of mind, and the hatred of evil. I thank you, Lord, that the reward of righteousness is your kingdom come and your will be done. I thank you that re the reward of righteousness is peace with you and love and soundness in our approach to you. And I thank you, Lord, that the reward of a prophet is a warning and a rebuke and a correction, but it's also multiplication and the miracles, signs, and wonders. I thank you that the reward of a prophet is increase and truth in your name, God. I thank you that the reward of a prophet is to be able to see you as you are. God, a seer is a prophet and a prophet sees and the reward of a prophet is just to receive sight and to receive vision of who you are. So I declare that you will be holy and you will pursue holiness and you will pursue being pure in heart and you shall see God. Dreams and visions, prophecies as Joel prophesied. Increase, divine appointments, all of a sudden these increase again. Hearing and seeing the voice of God. And there's more. But I declare that over you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.